This episode of Notebook on Cities and Culture is brought to you by Small Demons, where you can re-immerse yourself in the sights and sounds of your favorite novel. Take off your jacket, pull up a chair, pour yourself a drink, and stay a while at smalldemons.com. Season 1 of Notebook on Cities and Culture is brought to you by Carl Haley, Daniel Murphy, and Douglas Dollars, who reminds you to be present, be loving, and that life moves really fast. It's Notebook on Cities and Culture. I'm Colin Marshall. On Wednesday morning, I took a ride on the Gold Line train from downtown Los Angeles east to Boyle Heights. There I walked mere yards from the Mariachi Plaza station to Libros Schmibros, a combination bookstore and lending library opened in 2010. I sat down with its founder, David Kippen, before he opened for the day. A true man of letters as well as a true man of Los Angeles, David also comments on books and literary culture on the radio, as well as Sirius XM's Bob Edwards show. He served as director of literature at the National Endowment for the Arts, where he got its Big Read program started. He was once a book critic for the San Francisco Chronicle. He's written The Schreiber Theory, a history of Hollywood filmmaking from a writerly perspective. He's translated Cervantes' Dialogue of the Dogs for Melville House Books. He's lived all over town, as well as outside of it. He calls himself the first Jewish returnee to the now predominantly Latino Boyle Heights. I found myself especially intrigued by his email signature, which reads as follows. Los Angeles is like your brain. You only ever use 20% of it. But imagine if we used it all. I think the future of book selling is in working class neighborhoods like Boyle Heights. Um, I, I uh, was very fond of Katie, still am, of Katie O'Loughlin, who f- must be 15, 16 years ago now, founded Village Books in Pacific Palisades. I bought the first book ever from her and, and 14 y- years later bought the last one. Um, she blames iPads and Kindles uh, pretty much exclusively for the demise of village books. And if that's true, um, then if book selling uh, or even my fluky uh, kind of book selling uh, is going to survive, it's going to survive in neighborhoods where there aren't a lot of iPads and Kindles. And, and that's Boyle Heights. Mm. People can walk in from the neighborhood. Um, and and grab a book, uh, literally grab it, hold and hold it in their hands. Um, I don't care if people read on you know uh, on goggles. Uh, the main thing to me is reading. But um, you know, I love a good bookstore or library, and I think they're going to last a lot longer in neighborhoods like mine than they are. Anywhere else, and you know, people who love actual books are willing to schlep here. Um, so you know, I, I I get readers coming and going. As a bookseller, can you really do you really find yourself blaming Kindles and iPads for anything? It's just in in terms of purely what what you can actually point to that causes any problems in the bookselling world. How how realistic do you think it is to say that Kindles and iPads cannibalize other book business? Um, I mean, I take it from real booksellers who who are pretty unanimous on that point that that iPads and Kindles have really um, hit them between the eyes. But I don't kid myself. Even you know, in whatever medium, reading is in exactly on the upswing. That was why I I sort of midwife this program uh, at the NEA with my boss Dana um, to get America reading again. And you know. When we started it, you know, 43 percent of Americans could say they – they no, 46 could say they'd read a book in the last year for fun. And when – by the time we were through – and that's me, not the program, which is still sort of limping along on a little less funding um, but unkillable, uh, it was up to 53. You know, we didn't do that single-handedly. Everybody was responding to what was perceived as a crisis. Um, but uh, – I'm I'm an optimist in these matters, and I have only to open my door uh, at noon four days a week to have that optimism reinforced. Now, when you talk about a project like Getting America Reading Again or, or Getting a Neighborhood Reading, what is important for people to know who never stopped reading? I guess as, as someone who never who never did 
stop or slow their reading habits might say, well, what's the problem? I'm reading, you know, I'm, I'm reading plenty of books a week. Uh, I think America's doing fine with reading. I, I mean, obviously in my house it is. So, you know, if I can generalize from there, you know, what, what should they know about the, the kind of, the kind of work you've done to, to repopularize reading about what, what should they know about the mission and, and why that, and why it is a mission? Um, well, let me just clarify first. I, I, I haven't gotten Boyle Heights reading. Boyle Heights was already reading. If a couple of more people are reading than before, I'm thrilled. But you know, part of it is just making available books, especially in in the language uh, of um, older Boyle Heights uh, residents who you know haven't had the opportunity to get books in their native language. Um, more generally, um, yeah, it's easy to be a bookworm and think that everybody's like you, and then you try and strike up a conversation with a stranger, and you realize that might not be the case. Mm. Um, talking about books is something I enjoy second only to reading them, and now lately writing them. Um, so, so you know, I'm selfish that way. Uh, it's not enough for me to read. I want to be able to, you know, shoot my mouth off about what I read to other people and, and hear what they're reading in return. And that's one more thing listeners may know you from is, you know, uh, commentaries on books on the radio, on the, on the Bob Edwards show, on other places. Tell me what and why is it important to you as well to to be a media voice about reading rather than you know someone someone people can talk to easily here in Boyle Heights uh, to, to be to be that to be uh, the, the 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 voice heard over the airwaves as well whenever you can or or in print you know same 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 deal. Well, one should never rule out the importance of vanity. Um, <laughs> uh, yeah, um, neglect not narcissism when trying to explain these things. But also, you know, why should books be any different from you know whatever people are talking about um, on television? I mean, you know, if if you know the reason they're talking about it on television is at least partly because they're talking about it around water coolers. Um, and you know, if I had my way, there would be short stories and book excerpts on every Sparklets bottle in town. If, if shooting my mouth off on the radio and in print help, certainly helps Libra Schmibros, I think. I mean, you know, people come in here all the time because Madeline Brand is always good enough to mention the shop when she introduces me and outroduces me. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, I who wouldn't? Um, be grateful for the opportunity in addition to getting to read um, more or less whatever uh, they 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 you know want to at any given moment to share their enthusiasm or their fury or whatever their reaction is to a given book with other people but it's it's most fun when it's a two way conversation that's why I insisted uh, at the chronicle um, first among all my colleagues that that you know every review or a column have an email address at the bottom. Now, when someone laments a, a lost era in America, they'll call it, they'll say when people used to read, when people used to read book coverage, when people used to read all kinds of books and short stories all the time, and when it was at the top of the American conversation, I mean, are they, are they describing a real era? Is, you know, what, what can you say about whether the nostalgia is for something that existed or if this is if, if that's an invented an invented element of America that maybe has a kernel of truth but maybe now they're making a lot of how uh, of the glory days of American reading um, you know you can't rule out sort of reflexive uh, uh, groundless nostalgia uh, as a factor here but yeah I think there was a, a time when reading had a greater centrality in the culture when you had guys like Clifton Fadiman um, and Bennett Cerf widely read and running the Book of the Month Club and, uh, you know, being selected for the club, you know, actually meant something, although you could make the case that nowadays we have other things that, that, um, at least approximate it, you know, fairly read book blogs and, you know, uh, websites devoted to books and book selling. Um, I think to a certain extent that nostalgia is, is justifiable as long as it doesn't uh, in turn justify quiescence. Mm. Um, I think uh, I think books are worth fighting for and to the extent that they've lost a little ground, we got to fight that much harder. Does it have to do fr with, with you think, the, the, just the number of things you can watch or read or hear or you know, this, the, 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 the amounts of media, the amounts of types of media just exploding? It's, books are, used to be one of a few kinds of media. Now they're one of hundreds of kinds. I mean, could that be enough of an explanation? 
Yeah, I think it's fair to say that there's more competition for bo- people's interest out there with b- more competition with books than there used to be. Um, but also, let's not forget, um, it's harder to get by in America than it used to be. Um, a lot of people work two jobs now. Um, a lot of uh, families uh, work two jobs when before one provider was enough. I'm not saying this is unprecedented. It was it was kind of true in the Depression, although in the Depression, people were probably in greater numbers out of work and so had more time to read as a consolation. Um, nowadays, I hope we're not approaching that state, but there seems like there's a little less – slack, a little less play in American life nowadays, and that takes its toll on available reading time. I want to talk a little bit about the changes you've seen, not not simply in the reading culture in Los Angeles, but the changes you've seen in Los Angeles itself. You've mentioned how many areas you've lived in and out of the city. And, you know, I think about the neighborhood we're in now, and it's, to me, this was always a neighborhood you could ride the train to and get out, come out of this fancy subway station, you know, a, a block away. Um, it wasn't always that way here. I mean, you, you mentioned being a rail geek uh, in a time probably when there was no rail in Los Angeles. Uh, tell me a little bit about what what strikes you as most different or what, what, uh, what's in, in, in the league of being most different from, you know, the earliest memories you have of Los Angeles in, in the way the city is and the way you get around it and the way that in the way you frame it in your mind? Well, certainly the city's been through enormous changes in transit. I mean, you know, the Gold Line didn't bring rail to Boyle Heights for the first time. You know, there used to be a pretty comprehensive interurban rail service in Los Angeles. And when I was a kid, that was that had been ripped out. But, you know, the MTA, which then we called the RTD, could still get me down Wilshire Boulevard to the beach or, or back toward downtown fairly readily. Um, you know, a rail system is like is like you know a city's um, skeleton. You know, you could say that of of you know the whole transit system. But when you um, add rail, uh, when you adjust rail, um, you know, you're sort of like a chiropractor. Um, you're you're tinkering with and ideally, you know, uh, shaping up um, the city's body. Um, you know, it's, that's why it's interesting to contemplate the prospect of high speed rail of this thing called the regional connector that you may know about, which I have my quibble with, um, cause it's gonna make the system a little more perpendicular. You know, people will be able to ride from Libros Mibros to Santa Monica and back on, you know, without ever having to change trains. It's what transit engineers talk about is the one seat ride, which is kind of a holy grail for them. But it's going to turn the ride from Boyle Heights to Highland Park and Pasadena into a two speed two two seat ride. Mm-hmm. Um, they're going to add a transfer station in Little Tokyo. So for the first time they're taking away something in order to give us more. Um, which would be fixable for $40 million, but I don't have $40 million, so who am I to tell other people how to spend theirs? Um, you know, uh, the city's getting easier to navigate. Um, I was, saw a cop on a bicycle this morning and I wondered if that example, um, you know, the, the increase in bicycle cops has somehow made it more justifiable, um, to people to get around. Um, you know, you, you see, you know, certainly not, not, um, by itself, but, you know, there's a lot more cyclists. Ciclavia is huge. They've just shifted the route actually so that in October it's going to go right by the newly brush me bros in Mariachi Plaza as opposed to a few blocks away, which I think is going to be even better. Mm. That too is a factor. And I think it's all, you know, redounding to the benefit of the city. Yeah, cycling and riding the trains are the actually the only ways I myself get around, but I've only been here a year. And I, I, I wonder the fact that there is more rail and there is more cycling, it, it, that, that changes on the city, that acts on the city, but it's also reflective of something here, it seems like. I mean, to me, it's always been that way because, again, I haven't been here very long. But as I understand it, there was a time when when people could not envision these things in Los Angeles. Is that true? Sonny, I wish I had a time machine for you. Um, there was a time, of course, when, you know, uh, getting from Wilshire and Doheny, uh, where I spent, you know, between seventh grade and twelfth grade, anywhere but the beach, 
um, or downtown or Dodger Stadium, miraculously, um, was daunting. Even now, even with the Metro app, which I which I you know downloaded the other day and could use a little work, although it's as with everything in LA Transit, a whole lot better than nothing. Um, it's it's uh, you know it, it's a it's a mixed report. It's getting easier, and the more non-riders see riders, um, you know, it's it's improving. Um, but we've still got a long way to go. Um, it just, you know, n- not just in terms of adding lines, but, you know, breaking down people res- people's resistance uh, to transit. Mm. Um, you know, I'm, I'm in a small way here at Mariachi Plaza. I hope chiseling away at that resistance, but it's going to take a lot of people in a lot of years. This is the kind of perspective I'm trying to get when I, I've, I've spent a lot of time before moving and even after moving reading as many books as I can about Los Angeles, trying to figure out, figure out the whole history of the city to the best, to, to the best that I can, to the best standard I can, and trying to figure out the, the ways that people have thought about the city over the decades and, you know, over the whole 230 years or so. But you're the, you're the book dealer here. Hmm. I mean, if someone needs to, if someone comes in needing to get a better understanding of Los Angeles, what writers can you direct them to? What types of books can you direct them to? I mean, is, is there a reading strategy to really get one's mind into Los Angeles? You grew up here, so maybe this question isn't even one that you you have you've thought about. But where where do you where would you send someone who asked that? Well, thankfully, there's no one strategy for learning about LA through books. Um, and lately, you know, the more I read, the more I, you know, rely on, uh, you know, new offbeat titles. I, I, in my book group just delegated to me and the local mystery writer Gary Phillips the privilege of picking the next couple of books about – and most of the books we do tend to be about – well, some of the books, not as many books as I'd like, but some of the books <laughs> tend to be about Los Angeles. And, you know, I hatched the idea today of, of making an out-of-print book club because I'm, mm. I'm giving a, a talk on Fitzgerald uh, at Muso Franks next week and, um, and went looking for a college of one, which is his syllabus for his girlfriend who couldn't <laughs> keep up with him, not that anybody could. So he basically created this one-man college for her to learn her way around. So I was like trying to find this book. I've had it a couple of times, but you know, I'll I'll, you know, sell it here and then kick myself because there it goes. And sure enough, I found it online. Um, so, you know, I, I'm certainly no Luddite. I'm grateful for what uh, the Internet has done for reading. I'm not as grateful for what it's done to reading. But, yeah, to come back around circuitously to your, your question, anybody getting started reading about Los Angeles should probably pick up Carrie McWilliams' Southern California, An Island on the Land. Um, still, still relevant after all these years? Yeah. I mean, absolutely. It's It's not a new book. It came out in – I don't want to embarrass myself. I think the early 40s. I wish it had come out in 1939 because sometimes it seems like that's when all the good L.A. books came out. Chandler's first Marlowe novel, um, uh, The Big Sleep, uh, Mick Williams' book, Factories in the Fields, um, which is more a California book than an L.A. book. But for crying out loud, Dalton Trumbo's um, Johnny Got His Gun, also not an L.A. book specifically, although it was written here. Um, I'm leaving off the good ones. Ask the Dust by John Fonte. Um, you know, Fitzgerald was writing Last Tycoon, even if he didn't, it wasn't published until posthumously. Um, I'm leaving off another good one. Um, that's how many of them came out in 1939. I'm actually, I've got a pet theory now that uh, I'm going to say. Annus Mirabilis of uh, Los yes, Angeles absolutely. books. And not just for books, but for movies. I mean, Gone with the Wind and, and, uh, Wizard of Oz, just to mention two directed miraculously by the same man, um, Victor Fleming, though uh, certainly um, as as interesting for who wrote them as most um, movies are as for who directed them. Um, yeah. Listeners might also know you as the author of a book that uh, is Hollywood history through the perspective of screenwriting. So as, as well, the, 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 some might know exactly where to go to get the theory on that. The Schreiber theory, in fact. Glad mm-hmm. you mentioned it and not me. Um, <laughs> anyway, um, I think 1939 and 40 are really the years that L.A. became self-aware. I mean, you talk to people about, um, you know, cybernetics and, and you know, psychology um, and they talk about a moment at which um, a computer 
becomes aware of itself as the moment you really have artificial intelligence, which we haven't reached yet, and maybe we should and maybe we shouldn't. Uh, they talk about the moment a child first recognizes himself in the mirror um, as as a turning point in human development. Well, I think a city goes through that too. Um, and 1939 and 40 um, is the year that the Works Progress Administration, the, um, the New Deal uh, um, WPA, created um, a scale model of Los Angeles, a huge scale model of Los Angeles that's going to be uh, a centerpiece of this exhibit that the Natural History Museum is cooking up. It, it just seems like that turning point when L.A. became or seemed to become a suitable subject for study uh, in, in books, in novels, um, as opposed to, you know, something that, you know, was written about by outsiders, although in some cases pretty well. Um, 1939 just seems like that hinge moment. And much as it's been studied, I hope there's something left to say if you look at it from that angle. And I've spent a lot of time myself at the downtown library trying to find books about Los Angeles from the last 30 years. Some are, I've turned up some that are decent, that have given me information and been entertaining, but there's not a lot of recent Los Angeles books that people really can unify around. You know what I mean? I, I, maybe I'm wrong. Maybe I'm missing out on, on, on some real gems, but modern Los Angeles books are not, not a robust category right now, are they? Um, well, the key 1939 book, just to get this out of the way, um, that I left out a second ago was Nathaniel West's Day of the Locust. Right. Um, but Further as, evidence that the good books are back in 39 and less of these days. Um, I mean, you know, it's hard to, it's hard to, you know, put anybody, not just in Los Angeles, but, you know, nationally or internationally to, to ask somebody to stack up against Chandler and West. <laughs> um, and I would say McWilliams. Um, but it's not like, you know, it's been, it's been completely arid these last several years. I mean, you know, hardly a week goes by. Somebody doesn't come into the shop asking for Mike Davis's uh, City of Quartz, which is a terrific book, uh, a terrific polemic. Um, I've just been dipping into, uh, you know, a long overdue reading of um, Otto Friedrich's City of Nets, mm. uh, which is about Hollywood in the 1940s, but also inevitably about the city in the 40s. Um, you know, I, these books, City of Nets and City of Quartz, maybe think that that there's, you know, some sort of quintessential Los Angeles book title that, that's just <laughs> waiting to emerge uh, and sounds equally like both of them, but I don't know what it is yet. Um, no, there's been a lot of writing, a lot of academic writing in recent years uh, about Los Angeles. And as with a lot of academic writing, it doesn't, you know, exactly compete with Chandler for style, but it's useful scholarship and, mm. and even better writers will draw on it. There's a lot of good journalism out there, even with the LA Times going through its its recent travail and not just in the LA Times. Um, there is, uh, you know, forgive me for sucking up, there's, there's good, um, you know, broadcast journalism going on around Los Angeles. I mean, there's execrable broadcast journalism <laughs> going around around Los Angeles, but you take the good with the bad, the bad with the good. Um, there's a whole lot of writing going on around Los Angeles recently. A lot of it ain't half bad. Some of it's very good, but I hope there's enough leeway left that the likes of me can still add to it. Um, I haven't I haven't really gone the distance about Los Angeles yet. I wrote the introduction to that WPA guide, um, which I'm pretty proud of, um, but uh, there's plenty left to say. You mentioned the beloved polemic that is Mike Davis's City of Quartz, and the the sustained popularity of that book and others kind of like it, or articles like it, polemics of various forms like it. it it's always made me think that there's going to be a certain a certain slice of the Los Angeles population, and I guess a large one, that's always going to want to hear how bad Los Angeles <laughs> is. You know, what I don't, I wouldn't call it masochism, but what, where, where do you think that comes from? That impulse to be told that this is, you know, one of the circles of hell, uh, perhaps lower, perhaps higher, but don't worry, you're in a terrible place. Getting that, getting reassured that Los Angeles is bad. Um, well, I mean, if you think L.A. is in love with its own destruction in City of Courts, take a look at the book Mike Davis wrote afterward called Ecology of Fear. Um, you know, he's not the only person to identify or the, even the first person to identify this. I mean, there's a Joan Didion line that goes something like, you know, um, destruction 
has always been LA's oldest idea of itself. I'm murdering it, that. Um, you know, yeah. Uh, if you look at David Eulin's pretty terrific anthology of LA writing for Library of America, there's a lot of, there's a lot of end of the world scenarios set here. And not just because, you know, this is where the, film de- technology to you know recreate them or create them um, was based I think partly because LA was created more or less from nothing um, not that any city isn't but mm-hmm. because it was created out of I don't want to say a desert because that's been kind of um, that 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 canard has been dispelled um, but certainly it was reputed to be a desert. Um, and to the extent that it was a whole lot less arable um, and livable in great numbers before Mulholland and Lippincott stole the water from the Owens River Valley, um, you know, it, it, it entered the public imagination uh, or became solidified in the public imagination as an ex-desert. Um, and so, you know, there is this this sort of um, uh, mystique uh, of, you know, from from dust you were created and to dust you shall return. But it's also, you know, a lot of um, vindictiveness on the part of people who only wish they lived someplace half so beautiful. <laughs> um, I mean that, uh, you know. I don't disagree with Mike Davis about a lot of the depredations that have taken place in Southern California over the years, but I still wake up in the morning and feel so lucky and so um, indebted to live in this place. Um, And that's why it breaks your heart when things go wrong. Um, But you won't catch me going away for four and a half years ever again. Tell me, you know, in, in that span of four and a half years, how quickly did how quickly did it set in that you you realized, uh oh, there's things from Los Angeles I'm really going to miss, and I, maybe I didn't realize that at first. Probably just after the plane took off. Uh-huh. Um, no, I, I knew I would be homesick, um, and if I hadn't gotten to travel around the country a lot for the big read, um, I'd have been even more homesick. Not that any other place takes the place of Los Angeles, but a lot of travel tends to distract you from from what you've left behind at home. Um, I mean, it's an old story uh, for all Californians. You know, writers move away and they're never the same again. Steinbeck, Dashiell Hammett. I mean, it's not a short list. Uh, once upon a time, I wrote something like, you know, L.A is the only place where even the natives have to move, have to immigrate. Um, I said this about California because I was writing for the San Francisco Chronicle and it seemed like the seemly thing to do, but I think I pretty much meant Los Angeles. Mm. Um, yeah, I knew I'd be homesick, but it seems a necessary rite of passage for a lot of Angelinos to move away and come back. You take it for granted and then you go away and you miss something you didn't know you'd Loved, hmm. and it's it seems even we, we, with residents of Los Angeles I, I speak to who've, who've been here a long time, they they have a kind of uh, vestigial sense of well I'll, I'll frame it this way you know we, you talk about Los Angeles as being created and it's you can read so many accounts of the the uh, maybe improbability of Los Angeles's creation and, and all it took to make the kind of city we find here in a place like this when they did it, but. There's there's that there's that, uh, that that feat that great achievement of of Los Angeles being built, but then there's also a sense, and maybe this is old twenty thirty years ago. This is when this was more felt, but a sense that like well, this is Los Angeles. What you want to build a bike lane? You can't do it. this. Is Los Angeles? Nothing ever gets done. You know, you do you know what I mean? The, the sense that well, the the impossible was 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 achieved in, in the creation of the city but now we can now now even the sort of relatively easy things can't be done even if that's not true that's that's a strange dichotomy that it's, 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 is that am i overstating it or is that a real thing the thing you want to tell a suicide is if you didn't know things would get this bad how do you know they won't get better mm. and maybe that's vaguely relevant to a city building los angeles was um, a very presumptuous, a very audacious thing to do and hardly anybody would have predicted it. Um, but um, those people, those doomsayers who predict Los Angeles's ruin 
uh, who see only the ruined parts of it when they look around today, I think they're underestimating the visionary. And I don't completely mean that in an altogether complimentary way, mm. but the aspirational um, nature of the city, which is in its very DNA. I mean, you don't move all the way here from way the hell somewhere else unless you have an eye toward um, the future. Um, maybe a selfish uh, aspiration, maybe in some cases uh, a, a rather more um, egalitarian vision. But there are more and more reassuring examples uh, around town. Ciclavi is one of them, though by no means the only one, um, of of hope for the city and not always expensive hope, sometimes uh, incremental um, hope. Uh, there's a piece in the LA Times this morning, uh, Nita Lelyveld, who has been given a great beat, you know, telling the story of Los Angeles through um, – small small um, anecdotes and and you know unsung individuals but she's really taken it and run with it um, there's a story about a guy um, uh, bicyclist riding the bus and his bike is stolen off those you know sort of tongs at the front of the bus I sometimes fear that myself it hasn't happened but I sometimes I'm afraid well apparently at least once it has happened and another guy on the bus um, took off after the thief and tackled him and got the bike back and they subsequently became good friends and the the strap hanger who hadn't been much of a bike rider before is now you know a rather um, uh, is now an apostle for bicycle transit and the two of them with their wives actually go for these long bike rides bike rides together I mean that's the sort of you know story that can choke me up um, I mean if you count Pat Morrison's Vin Scully profile that's that's you know two two instances of, of, you know, a lump in my throat in one morning, but I'm kind of an easy cry, especially where Los Angeles is concerned. I also only seem to cry uh, at good news. I don't know where crying <laughs> got this reputation as something people do when they're unhappy. The sense of keeping up, keeping your mind in Los Angeles, reading stories like these, re reading the papers, reading whatever kind of commentary you can, how active a pursuit does that need to be? It seems like an instinct for you, but... Other people say it's very hard to it's very hard to get the information about Los Angeles to get to get the stream of information you need to be sort of a fully active citizen of Los Angeles. They, they some describe that as the hardest thing about living here is that you can't quite keep your mind in the narrative of the, of the city. It's maybe they think it's too big or too diverse. It seems like yes, again for you that that that's that's your instinct. But is it? Does it also take that sort of very deliberate effort? Um, I would viol pretty violently disagree with anybody who tells you that L.A. is a hard city to follow. Mm. Um, I mean it's a time-consuming city to follow because there's so much going on here and so many people – keeping tabs on at least a part of it. But, you know, go to laobserved.com, this, you know, wonderful website that Kevin Roderick, um, uh, uh, you know, a disaffected LA Times staffer started years ago. I mean, that was my lifeline to Los Angeles when I was back east. Um, I mean, he links to more stuff than you could ever possibly read. And, you know, that profusion makes it hard to know everything going on, but it makes it impossible not to know at least something and be curious about more. But I wonder. Yeah, I, I don't. I don't think that it's difficult myself to to keep up with the narrative of Los, Ange Los Angeles. So shall, shall we say? But uh, I, I, I wonder what they're getting at. P people who think it is. I mean, is is it excuse making, or is it is there something to that that it's it's that there's you need a different strategy in Los Angeles than you know when you've lived in other cities. Uh, keeping up with them, did it feel like a different process than keeping up with this one? Um, well, it's definitely harder to keep tabs on other cities I was living in because I was spending half my time on L.A. Observed. <laughs> um, yeah, L.A. is huge. It's not the only huge city in the world. There's actually bigger cities than Los Angeles most people, including me, have never heard of in, in uh, what we, what we uh, condescendingly call a third world nowadays because um, there's been a general transition away from rural parts of the world into cities. But yeah, LA is, is a handful. 
I'm trying to think what would be unique about us, although it's never hard to come up with hypotheses in, in any aspect of the city. Um, I mean, partly, maybe, it's because the city is balkanized into so many different smaller cities. Mm. Um, I mean, the area is. Um, that's that's fairly unique in Los Angeles, in my experience, of other places, uh, however fractional. Um, but of course, every city has neighborhoods. It can, though, maybe be a little more intimidating to keep track of Los Angeles County, shall we say, when you can live in the middle of it, um, which I actually once you know, put a map of L.A. County uh, on um, a piece of cardboard and balanced it on my fingertip to, to see where the middle of L.A. County is. And it's mm. actually in the middle of the um, San Gabriel Mountains because there's so much of L.A. County people don't know of as far north as, as you know, Fort Tejon. Um, but, I mean, let's think of somebody living in Santa Clarita. Maybe they moved there because they didn't love L.A. and so that makes you less curious about it. But maybe they didn't. Maybe that's where the work is. Um, think about a kid. Think about their kid growing up not realizing just how much is going on um, south of him. Yeah, it's a lot to keep track of because you're also keeping track, one hopes, of of your more immediate uh, orbit. Um, but, you know, everybody is simultaneously a citizen of the city, the county, the state they live, live in, which is something they forget. I mean, we're all Californians and some of us even think of ourselves that way. But, you know, and, you know, the larger, you know, political and even geological, geographical um, concentric circles beyond that. Um, so I think it's incumbent on each of us to figure out as much as they can about the world around them, whether that's around them in a small radius or in, in the biggest radius um, you could name. Um, you know, I, on August the 5th, um, plan to be somewhere watching um, Curiosity, the new Mars lander, touchdown or crash down. I hope not, but whatever it's going happen. to do, you'll see it. I hope so. Uh, 14 minutes after it happens, unfortunately, but I'll see it. I found out about this reading about it in the paper this morning, yeah. which is, you know, the information provider that I seem mostly tethered to. Found out about it in the New York Times, which is which is kind of galling considering it's going to happen or it's going to be known about first at JPL, but the LA Times will get around to it. Mm. Um, be aware, be awake. Um, and and maybe in Los Angeles that has unusual challenges, but it's doable. And when, when I look straight behind you, I, I see a section, the section for an author that I've read about your enthusiasm for, Thomas Pynchon. Yeah. I see his book, Vineland, which I mean, those from around here will hear that title and think of the street mm. in the valley. And as I recall, it's it's one of the one of the books of his that deals with the valley deals deals with this deals with the greater los angeles area with with some directness and is with some acid as i recall uh you know tell me i can't i can't talk to you without asking what you thought of thomas pynchon's perspective on on the greater los angeles realm shall we say in a book like vineland you make me wonder whether I parked us at this table in the back of Libro Shmibro so that I'd have Pinchon ready to hand. I don't think so. Um, yeah, Pinchon is one of very few people. Um, I'd, I'd put Joan Didion into this company as well to have written well about both ends of California and, and at least three times in The Crying of Lot 49 in Vineland and more recently in Inherent Vice. He seems, even though he lives in New York now, to be – or so one hears <laughs> – to be you know, using L.A. as a kind of palate cleanser in between longer books about the world, um, L.A. and California, that is. Of course, he's been sort of a touchstone for me. I first read him my sophomore year in um, college and started where nobody should start. But that's what was on the syllabus, Gravity's Rainbow, which mm -hmm. a lot of people who, who bail on it early don't realize finishes up right here in Los Angeles. Right here, I would argue, with the new art because there aren't a whole lot of other theaters but at the intersection of the 10 and 405 freeways. The very one you managed. Yes. I, I mean, yes. Um, I, I, I won't say that factored into my decision <laughs> to manage the new art, but it, it certainly uh, wasn't a reason not to. Vineland specifically – um, 
is a wonderful book about all of California. Um, and the parts about Los Angeles, of course, have a special savor for me. Um, the parts about LA's labor history, studio labor history, um, are, are wonderfully written. Um, I wish he'd come back. Uh, he sure had an eye for the place, but it, he, it seems to have gotten under his skin in ways that aren't going anywhere. And I, I want to ask something about getting under the skin. This area does, but I do wonder if you also need to open the door to the shop. It may be noon. What time is it? Let's see. We were a few, a few minutes past noon. Ooh, so, uh, And there's somebody at the door, so ah. they're with me. Don't run away. I'm just a little late opening. Come on in. I'll get the lights on. What are you looking for? At this point, the customers came in, all eager to find something to read. I witnessed David spring into action. He helped a pair of teenage girls seek out gothic horror novels. He pointed one young fellow towards Spanish-language books and another, with some surprise, toward atlases. He suggested titles to some grandparents who came in looking for celebrity biographies for their college-age grandson. As past Notebook on Cities and Culture guest Alyssa Walker wrote in Good Magazine, if you're from the neighborhood, you can borrow up to five books for a few weeks for one dollar apiece, a figure which Kippen admits is more of a suggested donation. But that's when something happens, he says. He'll lend the book to an adult, and sometimes they'll come back with their children. A teenager will return with his parents. A little wooden table at the center of the space can be populated by four different generations speaking four different languages, perusing everything from fine art coffee table books to Agatha Christie murders translated into Spanish. The mismatched, often rickety shelves reveal a collection that's extremely comprehensive for its size. The holdings run deep in California and Los Angeles books, and he's got the classics as well as works of contemporary fiction. The entire operation is volunteer-run, and Kippen is looking for more literary-minded team members who can do everything from reshelf books to plan events and readings that draw new faces into the space. Currently, he's only open four days a week. Keeping most books rental only helps him make sure each book can serve the most people possible, but that's not the only upside to lending, says Kippen, with a grin. The other great thing, of course, is that you get to see people again in three weeks. It's exactly what I was hoping to see. Yeah, see I, me how too. You interact. <laughs> now, I, we 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 talked a little bit about uh, how how it gets under the skin of certain writers like Thomas Pynchon, uh, that Los Angeles does. And you mentioned a Los Angeles and California shelf. Why don't we take a look at that? Yeah, sure. Come on over. Uh, of course, Pynchon isn't on it mostly. Yes. this is nonfiction about Los Angeles, although with a couple of exceptions. But yeah, pull up a. I can just. Okay. Yeah, browse away. So, I mean, what, when you take a look at this, I mean, what do you, what do you see? What does your eye go to immediately that you, you would just thrust in someone's direction who wants to read about Los Angeles? City of Courts naturally is yeah. here. And for a change, we've actually got a copy. Those uh, are hard to hang on to. Fly off the shelves. Won't be here by the end of the day, I'm sure. It, maybe not. Only just came back in a little while ago. I mean, I'd certainly try to foist on him, you know, the LA, Guide to L.A. in the 30s from the WPA that I wrote the introduction for, but that I actually have in a stack over on the right because you actually have to pay full price so I don't piss off my publisher, University <laughs> of California Press. Yes. Um, James Hart's Companion to California, mm. so not, not exclusively an L.A. book, but it's right. an encyclopedia of California. He used to run the Bancroft Library at Berkeley. Mm. You know, there aren't a whole lot of good encyclopedias of Los Angeles. Right. Um, Leonard Pitt edited one several years ago, which I gather Bill Deverell is now updating, also for University of California Press. Uh, probably got that here somewhere if I squint for it. Yeah, there it is. Um, oh. And yeah, it's Leonard and Dale Pitt, his wife. Oh. Uh, I shouldn't miss that. Come to think of it, I wanted to look something up in there about 1939, about whether L.A. was done annexing other cities by then so that it actually had become self-aware. But we'll save that until uh, until. Could it have been done annexing by that point, I wonder? I'm not sure. Most of the annexing happened um, earlier than 1939 and had to do, I believe, in ways I should remember but don't, with, <laughs> um, with water rights. Mm. Um, cities, you know, trying to snatch them away from Los yes. Angeles or vice versa. Now, what else, what else can we give our listeners a, a sort of virtual tour of? What, what, what should you point them to when they come to Libos Schmibros? How should they 
What should they know to orient themselves in this store? Well, I mean, first, I hope you'll forgive me. They should they should be able to find the place. Um, you know, so get on the Gold Line, get off at Mariachi Plaza, and then right behind the elevator, more or less, right behind the sort of gazebo too. You'll find us. We're only here Wednesday to Saturday so far because money is tight. Um, we're there from we're here from twelve to six. Um, there should be. Uh, shelf on wheels out front so nobody is under any illusions about where the bookstore is um once you're inside i hope um you know the western wall um is is really our pride and joy i don't know if you know we used to be three blocks away and it's a job and a half um even to move one's personal book collection which this started out of and then has grown well beyond um and which, you know, my, my uh, colleagues here, bless them, um, would sometimes prefer were a little smaller because I have a little problem saying no to people bringing me books, um, <laughs> which is an amazing thing for people to do. And I, I, I don't like to say no. Mm. Um, but, I, you know, if, if we were going to undertake something as traumatic as a move, which, you know, if you love books, is hard enough to do, you know, with your own shelves, um, I, wanted, I wanted not to... Um, replace but to upgrade Um, and that meant I wanted a ladder on wheels and when I found one at a a folding borders um, I you know called a carpenter friend um, and and told him I wanted books from floor to ceiling on the western wall and uh, he said yeah and didn't stick me up for it and now I look up there uh, or climb up there and uh, and uh, I could stare at it all day. <laughs> so, yeah, that's where all the alphabetical by author uh, fiction and nonfiction is. It's kind of a screwy way to organize a library. But back when we had a whole bunch of mismatched shelves from a whole lot of decommissioning bookstores around town, you know, it was even harder to predict how big uh, a shelf I was going to need when I started out at A. So I thought, you know, put everything up there and then break out sections as needed. And that meant pretty quickly breaking out L.A. and California, mm. breaking out Spanish. But, you know, still a lot of the, sh- the stock, too much probably, is alphabetical by author. Fiction and nonfiction together. But we don't believe in arbitrary boundaries here at Libro Bros. The strategy then seems to be throw yourself in. And find where you're going to find what you're going to find, but uh, hope for the best. Uh, yeah, or or you know, ask whoever's uh, looking after the shop that day. Um, we got four people in here right now, um, and they seem to be after a brief orientation, finding their way around. But I am eminently available. Hey, by the way, just because I've got a microphone in my face doesn't mean I'm not available to help you find anything. This guy so this can is wait. LA type stuff. Yeah, also some California, even some San Diego. Um, so yeah, um, by all means, set up shop. <gasps> What's that? Edgar Allan Poe. Poe. Yeah, I think so. That is actually his only novel, which not a lot of people have read. Um, and uh, you know, you're welcome to it, though. It's a little weird. Maybe you want to start out with the stories and maybe the poetry, and then come back for it. But you tell me. And I will remove the mic from your face because no, no, I see I'm, you've got a jobs to do. And we, I'm not objecting. No, it's we've 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 recorded even even more good stuff than I get for uh, for every other interview I do. So I've been speaking in Boyle Heights at Libro Schmibros with the proprietor David Kippen, who you may know from. We can't say proprietor because this is a fiscally sponsored, oh. more or less nonprofit. I am the founder, founder okay. of Libro Schmibros, and without the people who have come my way um, to keep the shop open, it would be the other thing. It would be closed. Um, so, yeah, stick with founder. I've never said proprietor on the show, listeners. Just bear that in mind. Founder, David Kippen. You may know him from hearing him on the radio, hearing him on the Bob Edwards show. You might have known him from his days at the San Francisco Chronicle, or you might have known him from his days at the National Endowment for the Arts, or any number of places. But now you can find him here in Boyle Heights, right off the gold line, Mariachi Plaza. David Kippen, thanks so much for taking the time today. Thanks, Colin. You know your stuff. (laughs) This has been Notebook on Cities and Culture. I've been Colin Marshall. You can keep up with the cultural creators, internationalists, and observers of the urban scene on the show at colinmarshall.org. Thanks. And special thanks to the people backing this season, including Aidan Nolman, Andy Cooney, Ben Bartley, Brian J. Dell, Doubt Us Artwork, Greg Bigelow, Greg Linster, Henry Coronan, Humberto Grant, James Faber, Jonathan McKelmont, Mark Larson, Matt Warren, 
Mia Muratori, Nicholas Croft, Paul Doyle, Ray McGuire, Rob Montz, Robert Foley, Roberto Medri, Samuel Hansen, Sean Dudley, Small Demons, Stephen Inglaze, Steve Hemmer, TSD, and Wayne Wright.